as Algeria and the world become increasingly urbanized with ever more of us packed together in ever smaller spaces and some university campuses being like small cities themselves, how do we avoid also building up emissions, pollution, contamination and all the other environmental impacts that we naturally have as part of modern city life? What are attainable, sustainable targets, whether we're designing new places and spaces or adapting existing ones? And if we're to truly have greener cities and universities, do we need to change how we live, study, work, play and move around in them? These are some of the aspects of this, but to paraphrase a line from a 1950s American cop show, i.e. long before most of you were born, there are 8,000 stories in the greener city. These are just some of them. Our focus is on solutions and improvements, not cataloguing problems and uh, ascribing blame. So, so my perspectives um, around greening um, campuses and future cities and transport are based on 15 years of experience of driving sustainability within a university. And so I'm going to focus on um, the built environment of a university and how we can learn from, from that. And so we can see universities as mini cities, as Quentin just said, and this means they can be really useful living labs to explore sustainable solutions, sort of real live um, sort of time and with real live people. But there's lots of ways that we can green our campuses, our cities, but so much of those things are invisible. And that means that staff, students, other people aren't necessarily aware about all of those sustainable solutions. And we're maybe missing an opportunity to, to help people learn or to, to help uh, educate people about these solutions. So I think there's some practical ac ac um, actions we can do around um, trying to think, how do we make the invisible visible? How do we make those invisible aspects of sustainability visible on our campuses so everybody can learn about it? We, but we can also think about how we can link our curriculum the taught stuff with our estate. So, for example, for 10 years, I've run a module called Greening Business, and part of that involves um, our people who run the estate setting projects that student groups that they, they work on to provide sort of sustainable solutions. And at a higher level, we have a sustainable consultancy module with students working with external partners in a similar sort of way. So we can link the student activity with you know, driving real change within the, the campus and our, our mini city. If as a student you don't have those opportunities, there might be things that you can design yourself with real sort of partners and real people in terms of driving your own project design. At the core of all of this, though, I think is, is effective partnerships and relationships. And that could be really in any sort of element. But I think if we focus on sort of thinking about cities and transport, there are so many different stakeholders involved who all need to be able to work together effectively. And so we might have um, we might think about formal structures that can bring students into committees with other stakeholders, but equally students can drive you know, projects in their own cities, on their own campuses, using their own sort of great ideas, but sometimes might need support to help sort of navigate those structures. Again, helping them develop those relationships. So really, my the end of my uh, my few minutes is really to sort of say, you know, there's lots of opportunities for staff, students, estates to get involved in driving sustainable solutions on their own campuses or linked with the, the cities in which they're located. But at the heart of it are really effective partnerships between all of these different groups and really effective relationships between them. You know, really, that, that comes down to this idea of using our campuses as living laboratories. And the idea of a laboratory is that we have that opportunity to fail. And the university campus provides us with a slightly different, maybe safer space than a whole sort of city. We might have our own private sort of networks. So, for example, the university I'm at, Keel University, we were the first university in the UK to blend hydrogen 
into the, the alive gas grid. And we could do that because we have our own private gas network as a university. But that learning in, on a university campus, which hopefully, which luckily didn't fail, has allowed us to take that project onto a public site with another real public sort of wider community. You know, this is actually a really exciting time that we're living through for so many reasons. And that's absolutely the case with our energy systems, because we we are seeing a real shift in our production of, of energy. So you know, particularly in, in the UK, for example, we've seen um, you know, real decarbonisation of our electricity, mainly in the UK through um, offshore wind, but in other countries that will be solar. But it's not just about the generation. Um, we, we need to and we, we are starting to do energy differently. We need to be able to try and match our supply of energy with the demand for energy. And that also that that brings in this question of, of storage. But storage isn't just the answer because we can also use technology, things like smart energy networks and, and smart energy grids to to allow us to to put certain um, appliances, um, for example, you know, running when we know we've got lots of low carbon energy in the grid. But we can also integrate different sources of, of energy um, and bring in storage. And for example, hydrogen is a way of storing um, electricity that's been generated surplus through, through solar um, and can be used at uh, another time or even in another, another season. So, so I think there's really in exciting and interesting things happening in the energy sector. Um, and it is about us doing energy differently. But of course, again, this comes back to the sort of making the invisible visible, visible because we don't see these changes. And because we don't see these changes, it makes it harder for people to sort of understand what sort of changes um, are developing. So, you know, within our cities, within our buildings where we have sort of these new smart energy systems or new storage systems, also trying to really help people understand um, how these new systems and this energy transition works. Urbanism essentially is about physical infrastructure. It's urban, urban planning, which is about buildings and the space between buildings, the curb heights, you know, trees, the benches and the stuff, the tangible things. And it's about urban sociology, which is about people. And, you know, it's about how people connect with each other and what, you know, how they experience the streets and spaces. So urbanism is where the two connect and come together for me. And I think in Sustrans, uh, you know, for a long time, we talked about transport and more and more we're talking about how transport fits into that wider urbanism work, you know, city and place place making. I talk about this a lot. I've, I've, lived, I've been so lucky. I've lived in you know, various cities across the world. I grew up in India and Southeast Asia, lived in London and the US, but I made uh, Edinburgh my home in 2004. I came here to do my master's degree and I've stayed. I just love the city. It's magical. Despite the weather, it's magical. <laughs> so today um, I'd like to focus in on the work that I'm doing in Scotland and Edinburgh just very quickly, just to give you an overview of some of what's happening up here and what we can maybe transfer over. Uh, so basically, you know, working in Scotland over the past you know, decade or so, there's a real shift in narrative around transport and city building and, and place making. There's a real acknowledgement of the imbalance and the injustice that is that is baked into our current transport system. And I think that's that is a global issue. It's not just one for Scotland or the UK. So, for example, I know Quentin, you said don't go into the doom and gloom aspect, but there is you know, there are challenges that I think might be worth highlighting in terms of some of the issues that we are collectively facing. So, you know, there's a real intersection of inequalities, there's a presumption of car ownership, you know, 50, under 50% 50 of people in most deprived areas of Scotland don't own a car. There's a presumption of A to B journeys that overlook trips that are made from home to school, to work, to the shops, mainly carried, carried out by women, and major roads that cut through inner cities imposing poor, poor air quality. But the good news is that we are we have acknowledged these issues. We're starting a conversation in Scotland. It's a very loud conversation right now in the civic national local government world around what we do to, you know, as we recover from COVID, how do we tackle these issues, not just for COVID recovery, green recovery, but as we look to the you know climate crisis horizon. 
So in Scotland, there are some amazing policies. You know, the, the National Transport Strategy recently refreshed doesn't just talk about transport. It talks about equality, it talks about the climate crisis, economy, health and well-being. And I think that's quite fantastic because, as Zoe said, it has to be a holistic look at, at how we approach these issues. Um, in Edinburgh and Glasgow have set ambitious targets to go carbon neutral by 2030. But for too many of us, the local streets don't reflect these amazing policies that we see nationally and locally. I know decades of car centric planning have led to um, streets where people on foot and bike and public transport have far less priority than private vehicles. But transformation is possible. It's a very loaded word. I talked about that, you know, a lot. You mentioned the city center transformation project that I led in in the city of Edinburgh Council where we looked exactly at that. How do we reduce vehicular dominance? How do we start to put people at the heart of city building? How do we start to engage people who live in the city, who live and work and play in actually shaping what they want their city to be? And transport is an enabler of good city building. It's you know it's not an end in itself. Um, so the conversations we're having right now is, is around 20 minute cities, the 20 minute neighborhoods, 20 minute communities. How do you connect them across the city? And for me, that is exciting because change is tough and transformation isn't easy, but to have conversations around how we make change happen. The 20 minute concept seems to be one that really has caught people's imagination. And, you know, it does mask the complexity required to deliver it, but it's really an interesting way of, of framing what we need to do. And it's not about you know car free streets and zero emission, net, net zero and all of that. I think the narrative around that has to change to be about what happens to our spaces when traffic is taken away, you know, where music and art and theater and business can thrive and a different soundtrack to the city than the hum of traffic. So for me, I just want to end on that, that, you know, that isn't possible without collaboration. We are again picking up on Zoe's point there. We have to have a collective proactive approach and to reimagining a new way of life rather than expecting a return to the so-called normal when we when we come out of, of COVID. You know, it, we have to shape our future and avoid embedding the existing inequalities that we see and help shape cities that are fairer, that are healthier and truly resilient. It's about living locally. It's about having your amenities uh, within a 20 minute walk of or in everything you need within a 20 minute walk, whether it's your school or a, or a nursery or a health center, your library, everything that you need for your daily life to have to lead a good life within 20 minutes. It, as I said, it's a very, um, you know, Paris at the moment has rebranded its strategy. The mayor, Anne Hidalgo, talks about the 15 minute city and a collection of neighborhoods, which I think is lovely, um, 20 minute communities where people can come together, social cohesion. So essentially it's about transport and planning coming together to make our places better. Um, it's a very simple concept, I think, and it, as I said, masks the complexity, what is needed to deliver it. But if we can, I mean, it's amazing. I'm going to uh, do a bit of looking back and looking forward. Uh, for me, this is a personal journey because my PhD uh, subject was on transport and environment policy um, all the way back 30 years ago. And at that time, I was looking a further 30 years back at, uh, sim simply put, at why it was that we understood that our transport policies in Britain were uh, badly designed, and yet we kept making the same mistakes. Um, the conclusion to my PhD was more or less, why? Um, and now we've, so therefore I've got a 60 year record of asking why? Uh, are we continuing to make the same mistakes? So every time we have an opportunity to think differently, um, I, I'm just going to sketch out some observations about uh, what the core of those answers might be. One of the first things I guess I'd want to observe is that cities don't happen by accident. Now we can leave them to happen by accident, but with the right ambition, and imagination and determination, we can create the cities we want rather than be delivered the cities uh, that that, uh, uh, that other forces shape. Um, but futurologists um, haven't always done a great job of anticipating that that combination can really make a change, imagination, ambition, determination. So in the 1880s and 1890s in London, there was great concern 
that if horse traffic increased at the level uh, that it, it appeared to be, that London would be smothered in horse dung. And the pollution crisis of the day was uh, organic horse manure. Um, now, actually, within only a couple of decades, there was a very different set of concerns, um, which was the private uh, motor car, which was deemed to be a hazard apt to become a nuisance, in the words of uh, a, a 1910 House of Commons report. The same report suggested that um, the taxation of the private motor car should uh, really shouldn't be a problem. And if you were going to categorise it, it should be uh, because it was a luxury app to become a nuisance. It should be categorised alongside boa feathers, the wonderful long uh, uh, adornments that the ladies wore or billiard balls uh, for the snooker, the, the games that were played by the wealthy gents. Actually, that idea that road tra private road traffic should be taxed as a luxury app to become a nuisance is an important reference point as we work out how we might make our cities differently today. And in winning that objective of taxing things properly and investing in the green modes that Daisy and Zoe have pointed to, um, green modes of walking and cycling, so making them the core of our priorities, then supporting public transport options, then allowing for private mobility, because it's fantastic. We've got this ambition, many of us, for two cars outside our car, uh, outside our house, because they're fantastic. It's the wrong answer to the, to the question, but we've got to respect why people have sought that. Um, so what we know about green modes of walking, cycling and, and public transit, and we can consider uh, taxis and other similar forms as part of a public transport solution properly. Um, those uh, we know can give us a much better quality of life, much better uh, health uh, outcomes uh, for all people. They are much better for the poorest members of society, as Daisy has pointed out. And that's important if you want to consider the social sustainability of our cities in the long term. I think if you were trying to do a deal, however, with my colleagues along the street who do enjoy one or two cars, is to remind them that I think it was Le Corbusier, the French architect um, who worked, of course, a lot in North Africa, who observed that uh, every time we sit behind a car wheel, we are engaging in unpaid labour on our way to work. So actually, in Britain, typically people are putting in uh, an hour and a half a day when under normal circumstances um, in their car commute. This is unpaid labour that we should give back to them through a new approach. So I guess my last thought is that I live in the city of Cambridge and I live there really because it is a 20 minute city. From the age of 10 onwards, my children were able to walk and cycle to everything that they did, which gave me back more time. So I just observe these many benefits of making best use of the automobile and releasing ourselves from some of the tyrannies that uh, allowing it to accidentally uh, take hold of our decisions can deliver. Um, I don't think humanity is about to wake up in the morning and stop being competitive and showy. We enjoy displaying mm. our achievements. We like to show off new stuff. Um, what I think we do have the opportunity to, if we put the correct price on goods and, um, and, ta and tax them correctly, is to redefine quality. And redefining quality can and should include um, a rather showy display of how wonderful your quality of life is. Um, my commute is more beautiful than yours because I take it on this rather wonderful bicycle through this rather one, or I walk through this delightful park that we helped to uh, design in the last five years or whatever it may be. So redefining quality is, I think, an essential part of, of achieving sustainable cities. I don't think we should expect that we can 
dictate whether people are in cities, in suburbs, or distributed between urban and rural. Um, all three of these things are going to happen. And if we know one thing about planning, and we've also got an architect present, it's that we've always been overconfident about our capacity to tell everyone how to live. But um, what we do know is that we do have positive examples of each of those ways of organising ourselves. Um, and indeed, COVID has brought us many difficult things. It's made many things difficult uh, in households, in communities, in businesses. But it's also taught us uh, a whole lot of things that we can do without the need for travel. Um, in my own institution, there was a sense that it would be difficult for us to organise to do meetings uh, at a distance uh, and, and to to project our lectures um, over the internet. Um, I was told it would take me a couple of years to fulfil my ambitions. Well, it turned out to take a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see us ask ourselves the same provocative questions about um, how dense cities, uh, suburban layouts and more distributed rural settings could all see the carbon in their mobility uh, choices and in their mobility planning. One little thing that would help is to stop having ministries of transport and departments of transport and start having ministries and departments and committees for access. Ask ourselves a different question. How do we deliver access to the things we want in the lowest carbon way? I think that would really help us because we've just proved across the last year in many parts of the world, in many circumstances, that we can find other ways of doing things. My um, current work is around research, around transport and society. Um, but going back a few years, I was traveling across Algeria, um, found myself in the middle of the Sahara, 100 kilometers north of Tamanrasset. And there I lost my faith in the internal combustion engine because my truck I was on broke down. And I ended up spending 20 days um, stuck in the middle of um, Algeria. Um, so faith lost in that form of transport or that way of getting around. Um, but I, I don't think that the internal um, combustion engine has come to an end. Its usefulness, even in privately owned um, vehicles, still has a place in society, as has already been mentioned by Joe, Joe and um, others. But I, I do question its place um, and its primacy in, in cities. I was recently doing a, a literature review around speed, comparing the ad average speeds of different um, transport modes in cities. Um, and it's interesting that the modes that use the internal combustion engine, um, cars, trucks, buses, vans, are getting slower on, on average in many of our cities. For example, um, in London, the city I was born in, um, in inner, inner London, now the, the average speed of, um, of cars is slower than it was back in 1949. And you can see the inefficiency uh, of those modes in, in cities um, when they're traveling far be, be, um, below their design speeds. People get frustrated whether they're sitting in those cars or whether they're being obstructed by those cars because of, uh, because of congestion. In some some cities are actually quicker to run um, at peak times than it is to drive or to to catch a bus. It's usually twice as fast to cycle or use an e-bike or an e-scooter, which are increasingly becoming popular and useful modes um, across cities. And of course, walking. Um, which has been mentioned by some of our speakers already, is an efficient mode and has been for um, centuries and centuries for, for short local journeys. And thinking about hi history, if I look at um, UK cities, um, I can see that walking and cycling was the dominant mode from about the 1890s right through to the, um, the uh, First World War. Then there was a sort of period of transition um, to public transport, which dominated um, in UK cities through to the 1960s. And since then, we've transitioned, as Joe and others have already mentioned, um, to a dominance and reliance on the private motor vehicles. 
And there is some parallel um, if we look at Algeria. We can still see in the cities, uh, cities designed around uh, walking in places like the Souk in Constantine or the walled city of Gardaia down in the desert. And many Algerian cities today have modern tram systems, but if you look at Oran and some of the coastal cities, they already had electric trams back in the um, 19th century. And of course, today, cities like Algiers and some of the coastal cities um, have their urban motorways and highways, typical of cities around the world, dominated by, by the car. But there's some signs that since um, the turn of the millennium, it's, uh, since 2000, some cities are beginning to change. Um, just going back to my natal city of London, public transport since 2000 is once again the dominant mode in London. And since 2009 in, in inner, inner city London, walking and cycling rates are actually higher um, than the average, uh, than the use of the pr uh, private vehicles. So just going to back to my current research, I'm looking to understand how street use behaviour, design and regulation contribute to um, a street environment and culture that's conducive to movement on foot and cycle. And when I'm talking about a street environment and culture that is conducive, I'm thinking of one that's safe, one that's comfortable, one that's direct, one that's attractive, one that's coherent, one that's legible, one that's connected and inclusive to movement on foot and, uh, and cycle. So finally, turning um, our attention to university campuses, um, if you like, they could be seen as mini cities or in some cases quite big cities um, with tens of thousands of staff and students. And um, perhaps using uh, Daisy's um, image, the perhaps a perfect 20 minute city could be a university um, campus. So like, like cities, if we want to, people to walk and cycle, then those modes need to be an easy, safe and obvious choice on our university campuses for people to make. Uh, my own university campus is the University of the West of England in Bristol. Um, and over recent years, that they, we've made great efforts um, to make this a place where people would want to walk and cycle. So the, the student accommodation in that sort of 20 minute city um, kind of uh, mould is close to where people study, but it also has everything available within walking and cycling distance. Um, for those that need to go further afield in the city, the campus is dis not only is the campus designed for walking and cycling with no internal um, roads, but there are safe separated walking and cycling routes between the campus and, uh, and the city. In terms of public transport, there's cheap, fast, 24 hour frequent bus services between the campus and city centre uh, for those that need to go out in the evening and at weekends. And also it's been necessary to make driving inconvenient um, and expensive. Um, so people turn away from that mode. So by reducing year on year the number of parking spaces available and those that are left um, increasingly making them expensive for people to um, to use. And um, additionally, in terms of public transport, um, we've now got a direct long distance coach services direct from the campus to the places where the students live around the uh, around the country when they need to visit their family and friends. And finally, I, I think the point I would end on is saying that the, the university leadership and staff must also support, support the pr promotion of low carbon and active travel. Um, it's only if students and staff are working together will these things be achieved. I would um, say that a, a good place to start is the university campuses. And um, for, if we're talking about being beacons, couldn't some of the, the university campuses across Algeria be those beacons both for the cities they're in um, and for the, the, the country as a whole? We've described them as, as, as mini cities. Um, they are places where um, uh, the, the thousands of students and staff could potentially be role models in terms of walking and cycling and, uh, and using public transport, being that hotbed of, uh, uh, of ideas, both practical ones like Zoe's been describing has been put into practice at, uh, at Kiel that you could put into practice in your own university uh, campus. Um, and to work uh, and partner with the um, the the um, local authorities in the in the city and city authorities in the in the wider city, so that the university campus can be that example of. Um,
my, my emphasis is on on the transport things, the walking and the, uh, and cycling, but it could be other things like energy as well. But putting them into practice on the campus and then partnering with the city authorities to see how that, that could be extended to the wider city. Uh, I just wanted to show off my uh, fancy uh, gilet orange, which I wear as I cycle around the streets of Algeria and my flashy helmets, which people seem to enjoy safety and uh, visibility, uh, killing two birds with one stone. Have a good weekend, everybody.